Thank you, Joan, and thank you for the invitation to talk here um, this morning as well, especially as a historian. And I will limit my comments to sort of two uh, interconnected um, lines of arguments uh, looking at the transatlantic dimension here. You've already heard a lot has happened this year. It started with a uh, uh, um, with a joint statement in March by EU president and uh, the Kenyan prime minister. Then we had a lot of site talks during the G7 meeting in June in Bavaria between uh, Olaf Scholz, uh, German uh, chancellor and Canadian prime minister. Uh, then we had the visit of the German chancellor in August. And then as you have already heard at the end of the presentation of uh, uh, Professor Knud, um, the kind of the new collaboration that we see emerging here. Um, I'm looking at this as a historian and um, looking back at the many instances where we have Canada popping up as uh, some sort of a, a savior in these times of energy crisis. So the first argument that I want to make is that the way that Canada um, enters uh, the discussion on transatlantic energy relations is in two areas and one is really around energy trade and the idea that Canada would be a reliable energy supplier because it's a western democracy, um, it's safe, it's reliable and it has a lot of energy. And the second one is around this idea of being a like-minded ally in um, global energy governance that proposes uh, an energy security agenda. Now the first one I would call more aspirational than real. So while um, we see ever so often um, these agreements, um, we also have to remember that first of all, most of the energy production, energy trade is uh, provincial powers in Canada. And so um, it's, 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 it's a lot more complicated than uh, we seem to uh, be able to understand from the outside sometimes. So even if I see you know, Canada as uh, uh, potentially uh, a green hydrogen provider, that of course is a particular province. Quebec is pretty much proposing green hydrogen while another province where I'm located in Alberta is blue hydrogen. Uh, and so um, there might be you know, on a federal level if we all uh, aggregate what we look at, Canada looks like a very reliable supplier but then if we look at who is actually making the decisions, it is sometimes below the federal level, so in provinces, but even more so, of course, these are commercial actors. As we have seen from the discussions around potential LNG export facilities in the eastern part of Canada, these are commercial decisions, even though the federal government may create a favorable investment climate or help uh, support a regulatory regime that allows all of these. And the, at the end of the day, it's companies making those decisions. And currently Canada does not have, for example, any LNG export facilities. And the earliest one that will go online is out in the Pacific in Kitimat. And so while there's a lot of talk about how Canada could step in and could help Europe, we also have to be uh, very realistic about what is possible. And at the moment, it is not possible for any LNG to be, for example, exported from Canadian, from the um, eastern part. It is also aspirational um, because, uh, of course, most of the energy trade, when it's oil and gas, still goes to the United States. So in 2021, 97%, for example, of crude oil exports from Canada went to the United States, 2% only to Europe. And um, I think that uh, there is a reason why um, the European Union and also countries like Germany like to look towards Canada, but that is much more based on one, the aspiration of maybe in the longer term, some trade links that allow for some energy uh, uh, trade across the Atlantic. But more importantly, and this brings me to the second part, it really is symbolic in the way that it um, reinforces kind of a transatlantic value community around the idea of energy security, around the idea of, uh, of supplies of uh, energy from safe and democratic countries. But here, I think we have also seen a development 
that really changes what would constitute the transatlantic energy security uh, uh, environment. Uh, and that is, and as you've heard this already, essentially the meaning of energy security has been broadened to include um, climate action as well. And even if you look at what the G7 uh, uh, statement that came out uh, 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 around energy security, the idea here was that energy security is best, uh, is best uh, uh, ensured through pushing on with the green uh, transition, with the energy transition agenda. And that in itself might pose a problem for Canada because Canada still is one of the biggest fossil fuel producers. And so it really needs to kind of walk a very thin line between uh, portraying itself as someone that can step in and help out in these times of crisis because it is a fossil fuel producer, but realistically, as I've just pointed out, it really cannot do in the short term, but also not losing sight of what might happen in the longer term in a decarbonizing world, or at least in a decarbonizing EU. And that is having to switch to different uh, types of energy sources. And that explains why we see so much talk, for example, about hydrogen at the moment. But it's a very tough position that Canada really is in. Now, my last point here as a historian, what I would say, though, this is not new. I think it has always been since the 1970s and the signing of what's called the Framework Agreement in 1976 between Canada and the EU. It has always been about the aspirations. It's always been about Canada is a safe producer of resources. Europe needs resources. Isn't that complementary? But if you look closer, it has never been complementary. If, if at all, it is Canada being able to ease the pressure overall on a global market, which then hopefully will ease some of the problems that Europe has, and not so much the direct um, trade. But the second point that I think I would like to make is that even though we are used to the cyclical reemergence of the energy security paradigm during times of energy crisis, it never repeats in the same way. And I think what we see currently is that we really are at, um, at an important threshold where that energy security paradigm, which traditionally was focused on oil, which traditionally was focused on the strategic meaning, is now so much more interlinked with climate action and decarbonization that it has become a different energy security narrative. And that Canada has to be very careful in understanding this type of change because otherwise we see what has happened very recently, and I'll finish with that, that there is a different discussion around clean versus green energy. That coming out of the EU, very often it is, it is focused around green, which is uh, really renewables, energy efficiency, and then the, the kind of separate discussion in the Canadian context, which rather looks at um, the overall net zero, or lower carbon discussion. And this would allow us to bring blue hydrogen into the discussion. So for me, the current crisis, on the one hand, accelerates a changing energy security environment, which you know the geopolitics of renewables are different. Uh, the old peripheries of Europe are no the biggest hubs for LNG uh, import uh, uh, facilities like Spain. But on the other hand, it's also nothing new. And that's kind of what I would uh, 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 sort of bring here as a uh, um, starting point as a historian. Thank you.